Uh, Let's uh, open to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. We'll start there. We got used to having short talks with the masks on, that, you know, and enduring that. So I'll try and keep it short today and uh, see how we go. Hebrews chapter 9, I'll read a few verses uh, in verse 24. It's uh, towards the end of an explanation. The Hebrews is, um, we believe, Paul's uh, wrote uh, Hebrew, and uh, he was writing to the Jews who were converted to Christianity and uh, bringing the old pattern of things into the New Testament, seeing how they're fulfilled. And, and this is one of those. It's about sacrifice. And read in verse 24. He says, For Christ, Jesus Christ, has not entered into the holy place made with hands, into the tabernacle or the temple, uh, which are the figures of the true, which are a pattern of things to come, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet has it should that he should offer himself often as a high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others, of sheep and bullocks. And so the Day of Atonement, the Jews still celebrate the Day of Atonement. Uh, Once a year, uh, the high priest would go in and make sacrifice for the sins of Israel for that year um, so they could restore their relationship with God and, and, and press on and start fresh. And so that was uh, the pattern in the Old Testament. The Jews still do it today, but they can't make a sacrifice and they can't be forgiven for sin. Right? So if you ever have a conversation with a Jew, there is no temple, so there's no way of going into the holy place and uh, seeking God because the Old Testament's fulfilled. Uh, it's an interesting point there. So we read on in verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so back here, it's 2,000 years ago. It wasn't the end of the world then, but in the last age. Uh, and uh, we expect Jesus Christ to come back in this age. We have for different ages. You know, we had Adam and Eve, as uh, Sherry mentioned. We had Noah, the dispensation there, um, and the flood, the judgment there. We had um, Abraham, and then we had the law, Moses and the law. And now we've got Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus Christ right through to the end. What he said, what he promised, is right through till today. And it says in verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that this, the judgment, so Christ was once offered for, to bear the sins of many, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So as I say, it's just an end of a, an, an explanation about sacrifice in the Old Testament you know, to feel right with God. You paid a price. You got a, your favourite sheep or a good sheep. It wasn't the one that was about to die. You got a healthy sheep and uh, that innocent lamb, that innocent uh, uh, animal uh, died and it cost you. You know, you, that, was, that was part of your flock. And uh, they didn't have a lot of sheep in those days, uh, part of your flock. And so, you know, you felt after you'd paid the price, you were forgiven. And, and that was the pattern in the Old Testament. And, and you, you tried to keep the law of do's and don'ts in the Old Testament. And so you, you sin again and you, you got condemned, you feel condemned. And, well, you, you'd go and pay this price again. And, uh, and so it taught you to, to be careful how you behaved. But also it, it was a continuous thing and it was costly and, and uh, you know, it was never finished. In the Day of the Tome, it was every year. And, uh, and what it's telling us here, what Jesus accomplished was once and for all. Isn't that remarkable? There are not many people who understand that your sin's forgiven once and for all uh, in the Bible. That we'll cover that in communion a bit later. And so also a point I want to make in the theme of this talk this morning is that it's appointed unto men once to die, but after that judgment. And Jesus died and he rose from the dead at the specific time as prophesied because he was innocent. He was sinless. And the judgment was innocent and he rose. But he died for our sins because we are guilty. And, and once for all, as it says there. So the judgment took place at his uh, death and his resurrection, uh, confirmed he was innocent, and that was the judgment of God. And it reminds us here and it tells us that we don't get a second chance. There's one death 
and then you're judged. There's no reincarnation in the, in the Bible. There's no coming back as something else. There's one chance. You've got your lifetime to find the answer, and it's not hard. We're going to show it to you today and, and do something about it, all right, and prepare for death. I mean, I'm going to talk about death today. It sounds a bit morbid, doesn't it? But uh, we had a couple of funerals recently, and the one thing that comforts us is they were prepared for death, Every week they, they knew what they had to do to be saved. They knew they were saved, their sins were forgiven, and if they got hit by a car, they knew they were going to go to heaven. And uh, we were going to talk about that confidence, that assurance uh, through Jesus Christ, as it says here. And so uh, just pointing out our know, theme is about, about death because we can talk about signs of the times and prophecies and great things we, we see around happening around about us, but... Um, we might be here for a bit longer, but one thing's for sure, people are dying every day. Death is definitely happening. There's no exemption. You don't say, oh, well, you don't have to die. It's going to happen. And uh, these bodies are going to expire, and, uh, and then that's it. We, where do we go from there? What happens then? And uh, that's what the Bible uh, and, and Christianity is about. It's not about collecting money for the poor. It's not about doing all these sort of good works. It's about you know, a certainty of living forever. And if you're not certain of that, then you're in the wrong place. So let's have a look at some scriptures about this. Matthew chapter 10. I, um, before I got filled with spirit, as I say I was a bit of a, an atheist. Um, I didn't rubbish religion or that, I just couldn't believe. Um, and so I uh, went to, I had a friend that was uh, working for the ABC and he was making a film on folk that had uh, near-death experiences or after-death experiences, you know, died in the operating table, came back to life. And uh, there's about six, I think, and uh, he making a, video, uh, a TV um, documentary for that and interviewing them and I was able to go along and meet them and, uh, and hear about their experiences, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel people talk about. And, one fellow said, I, I saw Jesus. He looked like Harry Belafonte. Um, and there were a few weirdos there, i got to say, but there wasn't a common theme uh, that, uh, you know, meant that it was real, that, that, that made it conf uh, confirmed that was, you know, definitely uh, they had died and, and gone someplace or saw something. Um, and uh, it, yeah, as a result of that, it didn't, didn't uh, uh, cause me to believe that it was life after death. I've just got to say that, because sometimes people will, will challenge the Bible by a different experience, a different thing, and, and I did look into that, uh, mainly because my friend uh, invited me along, and my sister was acting in the film, so in the TV documentary. Uh, so they reenacted a lot of these uh, experiences they were talking about. And as I say, there was, it wasn't a common thing that people had different uh, experiences than that, and I later learned uh, medically, that the, the brain does some weird things after you die, you know, after you stop breathing. The heart stops, you stop breathing, and the brain suddenly throws adrenaline into the system to try and get things working again, right, and, and does all that. And, and there are a few other things I won't talk about because they're a bit creepy. But, um, and, you know, forensics, you know, for example, the body starts moving after, you know, after it was killed in this position, it moves into a different position. Anyway, I'll leave you to investigate that. But, but yeah, there are all these sort of things that happen naturally. And so, as I say, it didn't convince me um, that there was life after death. But here in Matthew 10, we talk about uh, in verse 28, it says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And it says, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them uh, shall not fail, no, fall to the ground without your father. But the very head, hairs of your head are all numbered uh, in the sight of God. Fear you not, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. And what, what the Bible's talking about is that there is um, a pattern in nature and, and situations in nature for animals to survive and thrive and all that sort of stuff. And the Lord says, well, he cares more about his relationship with man than, than nature. Nature's doing fine despite, you know, the chemicals we throw at it and the different things we do. Um, nature seems to survive. And so back here we're reading about, you know, God can destroy life and your soul, the real you inside. The soul is that 
immaterial part of you that can't be prodded or operated on or, or pulled out. It, it's a real you that um, I guess experiences things like guilt and, and, uh, and love, I suppose, the things that are good for us. We have these good uh, experiences and, and thrive on that. Uh, you know, not just food, we thrive on that too, don't we? But there are other things we do, but, but you know, things you can't put your finger on or can't dissect, that, that affects us. And it's a real us inside, looking out. You know, you can live without an arm and a leg, but you know, that, that thing that, that uh, lives until we die is, is our soul, is us. And so the Lord is reminding us, here he says here you know there are priorities in life you know you like to join a gym get fit or maybe you like to do other things look after yourself well what are you doing about your soul and uh, what we see throughout you know just life is that people who have everything are still empty right they still fill themselves you know you you wonder how somebody who's rich and wealthy and educated and all that go into drugs you know turn to that because they're trying to fill their life up still even though they seem to have everything and the lord's addressing this point jesus is addressing this point i want to deal with your soul i want to talk about that and uh, and that's a very important part I, as i say i think you probably recognize what he's talking about um that thing that's in you that people can't see it's not your brain, it's not something else, but it's the real you. And, uh, uh, and either it's satisfied or it's not. And uh, we're reading here about, you know, um, as it says, we uh, read how God is interested, God can see. And I often wondered, you know, we've got wonderful technology that can see things all around the world. I, I drive with a sat nav, as you do. It used to be the UBD. Oh, I was forever stopping and trying to find out where I was going. But the sat nav, it just tells you where to go. And in fact, mine tells me there's roadkill on the road. It's, you know, watch out for roadkill. I, I don't know how it sees it, or maybe it's been reported by somebody else. But, but you know, we, we just live in a world where you can just do things without understanding how. And uh, it makes me respect the Bible. For example, when I'm talking about your soul and, and living forever and, and that information that's you, well, we already know that you can store data in the clouds, not those ones up there, but, but off your computer somewhere. You don't even know where it is. It's got a photo of you someplace, you know, in, in uh, zeros and ones. It's all recorded. It doesn't, I mean, I can't explain it, but it's real. And so what we're reading here is God has a real interest in you you can see what you're going through. In fact, he no, uh, no doubt has uh, ordered your life so that you'd be here. I remember looking back on my life, I became dissatisfied with what I was doing. Uh, I wanted to enjoy it more and I seemed to enjoy it less the, the longer I was hearing about the gospel, about getting the Holy Spirit and baptised. And it brought me to a point, well, why not have a look? And then that brought me to a point, why not do something? And then I got filled with spirit. You know, it was no accident. I could see it was set up, and uh, that's how God works. And so in this first scripture we're reading here, we don't fear. We don't fear. We, we respect that God's in charge, and let's uh, listen to what he says. Matthew 16, over the page. And say, so I can't make you do anything. It's a choice, and uh, God's laid it out so that... Uh, um, it's in our favour to receive the Holy Spirit. Matthew 16, verse 26. Uh, I read about hell back there, and um, the word is actually Gehenna in the Bible, you know, in, the, in the Greek. And uh, Gehenna means Valley of Hinnom. You probably wonder how, such a different word. But it's speaking about the rubbish tip outside Jerusalem. And as we just read there, you know, about um, uh, God can destroy the, the body and the soul in hell, and uh, it's reminding the Jews, the people Jesus is speaking to here, that um, you know things get thrown out, and 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 the valley in them was the southwest little valley. Uh, Jerusalem's on four mountains, four hilltops, and so down the side, southwest side of of Jerusalem is the rubbish tip, and uh, and that's what it's saying. God, God uh, will either you know respect you and, and work in your life, or discard you in the rubbish tip. It was also the place where the worshippers of Molech, which is an Old Testament God, where they would think that their God wanted them to sacrifice their children. And so they would burn their, their, their child, their oldest child there. And it was a, a crazy place. And that's where the Lord says, you'll end up in confusion and 
you have no future. Um, and so that's why we listen to what Lord's saying. And they go, okay, well, I can do that. And uh, even if I don't believe it, you know, I don't uh, have a lot of faith in it, I'll do it anyway and find out. Because when we receive the Holy Spirit, he gives you faith. That you makes the believer out of you, as I mentioned in my uh, experience. I came from um, uh, not being prepared to believe anything to suddenly having no doubt. All right. So here we are in Matthew chapter 16 and verse uh, 26. Uh, it says here, what, for what is it profited, a man profit, what does he benefit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of the Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works, his deeds. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And, um, and so the first point is, yes, there are a lot of things that are worth doing in life, um, but, um, uh, you know, would you exchange your soul uh, for a different life? Would you risk that? And so it's a matter of priorities, isn't it? So let's, let's get our soul right, let's get right with God and then enjoy life, and, uh, and that's what we're doing. Um, but uh, as you say here, it's your choice, uh, but uh, the priority is, you know, life or death. And uh, not, uh, you know, riches or death, but, but life or death. And so in the meantime, he's saying here, there is a judgment coming. Jesus is coming back sometime or we are going to pass away, uh, fall asleep. And it's like that. It's not necessarily a tragic situation when somebody dies. You hear of somebody uh, who'd passed away and they say, I oh, passed away peacefully. Right? It means he fell asleep or, or your heart just stopped and, and he conked out. It's not necessarily tragic. You know, I guess there are uh, tragic circumstances when people die, but, but you could die quietly or in, in your sleep or, or, or something like that, or maybe you're on palliative care and they just keep up, upping the medication until you die in a high. I think it probably is. You've got so much, um, uh, what is it, morphine in your body that um, your brain is quite happy. But um, it's not, as I say, tragic. What he's saying here is it's tragic and, and he said, these people standing there 2,000 years ago, it's not that they're still alive today. It means in the resurrection, in the judgment, they're going to taste of regret. Um, that's what we do when we die, isn't it? We regret, oh, I wish I had more time to spend with my wife and kids and grandkids. You know, I wish I had more time to finish what I'm doing. You know, I've got things to do. I don't want to die yet, you know, and so we, we were hoping to extend their life and keep going. And, and uh, maybe you've got regrets and they go, oh, I wish I did it differently through life. What a waste of time it was, you know. Maybe you had an alcohol problem or something like that and, and you finish your life with regrets, maybe in a hospital bed someplace, uh, regretting things and apologising for things. But uh, the greatest regret, as Jesus is saying here, comes when, when Jesus returns and we could have done something and we didn't. You know, these people saw the miracles, they heard the wonderful promises, and he says some of them, maybe many of them, didn't do anything about it. And so, um, you know, we're, we're not uh, uh, threatening you with that. Let's, let's just keep reading and see what is available. But Jesus said that's, that's a great regret, isn't it? That um, you could have lived forever, you could have um, enjoyed the miracles, you could have, uh, you know, had a different uh, ending to your life uh, and, and even helped your family if you'd known the truth, but uh, you didn't do anything about it. And so uh, that's a, a, a regret. Let's have a look. Um, as I say, uh, th that's generally what uh, uh, hell and, and uh, judgment's all about. It's this great day of regret. It talks about, you know, those that, that knew the Lord or even filled with the Spirit and walked away will have the greater condemnation, the greater regret. I think of um, Judas, you know, after he betrayed Jesus, after Jesus was crucified, he couldn't live with himself. You know, what have I done? He couldn't undo it. He tried to give the money back, you know. Take it back, take it back. And they, they wouldn't have it. And, and he, he hung himself. Or in fact, from the description there, um, he, he dropped himself off a cliff. Right? It says he burst asunder. I don't know if that happens when you hang yourself, but certainly it does when you drop, drop yourself off a cliff. He couldn't live with himself. Um, it, was, it was the expression. And so, you know, that, that day is going to be a day of, of, you know, not burning in fire, but a day of, oh, I should have done something about it. 
and uh, because it's a gift, it's free. Let's have a look at another scripture, uh, moving along uh, up to Matthew 5, back to Matthew 5. Just staying in the New Testament today, um, as I say, I want to keep it short, and just look about this theme of death. I mean, it's, it's not threatening, is it? We, we realise, you know, I wouldn't mind a good sleep, actually. I'm trying, not that I'm suicidal or anything, but, you know, when you've found the truth and you've got life and eternal life, you know your future, you think, well, let's, let's move on, let's get on with it. Uh, as Paul says, to live is Christ, you know, is good life, but to die is gain, you know. Dying is a nice sleep. And so we don't mourn uh, particularly what's happened to our brethren when they pass away. We'll miss them. But we, we think we, uh, we know they're, they're asleep in Christ. Let's have a look at this scripture here, Matthew 5 and verse 3, talking about um, you know, soul not being satisfied. And it says here, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And uh, in these verses, we're going to read through. We'll just probably stop and think about it. Poor in spirit, uh, it's talking about a humble position, person perhaps feeling a bit low, a bit flat. Uh, well, God's going to permanently change that. He says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, God is going to empower us with, with this, this gift. We're going to see all these situations we find ourselves in and probably brought us to, to a meeting or brought us to the Lord are uh, just, uh, you know, life, isn't it? Uh, to feel flat, poor, feel like you're, you're running on empty, you can't quite explain it, but there's something missing, something you need, something you've got to do, all right? And it's frustrating, you know, you, you just can't sort of feel um, satisfied. And blessed are they that mourn, you know, grieving about something, regretting something or, or troubled by things, injustice and so on. Uh, it affects people. I, I had a relative that um, was forever regretting something in the past and uh, just couldn't enjoy life. And uh, it says, for they should be comforted, right? End of heartbreak, end of, of grief and stress. Blessed are the meek, the teachable, those are looking for answers, for they shall inherit the earth. And, uh, you know, they've got a future. They're going to learn about something that obviously we're not born with. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I think of Suzette's testimony, how um, she was looking for perfection in everything. You know, there are people that um, uh, get depressed because they want everything they do to be perfect. And they want, um, you know, a perfect result to achieve something and, and know that that's it. That was the purpose in life instead of achieve something and having to achieve it again or having to achieve something else. You know, there's no real answer. It's just a rat race. And so as it says there, those that hunger and thirst for right perfection, uh, as it says here, will be, uh, they shall be, be filled. Their lives should be filled. Uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The kind, the gracious, the people that, that do favour others. It's a frustrating when you're a kind person. I'm not saying I'm a kind person, but a kind person, you don't seem to get a reward. There doesn't seem to be justice in this life. This fellow went round and told people to repent. And everybody was impressed with him and went out and got baptised. He had quite an influence on people, but he said, look, my job is to baptise the Messiah is coming, the one who I'm not worthy to undo his, his shoe latchet. Uh, he's going to baptise you the Holy Ghost. A wonderful, simple explanation of the different uh, purposes and, uh, and what Jesus was to do. And we ask you, has he done it yet in your life? Have you been baptised in the Holy Ghost yet? Because that was his purpose. Yes, he had to die and rise from the dead to make it happen, and we're going to see what to expect. And in verse 8, he says, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you should be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, Perth, Western Australia. All right, and so this is a promise. And um, he said, I've been promising it for a while now. We can read in detail uh, about you know, receiving the Holy Ghost in John 14 and, and John 3 and throughout the, the Gospels there. And he says, it's about to happen. And uh, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to send this holy, means different, separate, uh, ghost or spirit, it's been translated Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit in, in the English, um, a different life. 
uh, from God. And so they prayed for about a week. We can read. We're going to shorten it down to verse 4 in chapter 2, uh, get to the point straight away. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And uh, there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heaven which heard them. And because of time again, in verse 12, they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what mean of this? What, what's the purpose of this speaking in tongues? What, what's this noise, these languages? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. They're drunk. That's what it is. It's just gibberish, right? And sometimes people have that, that reaction. But Peter, standing up with the 11, uh, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you. And hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is the third hour of the day, nine o'clock. The day started at 6 a.m., uh, so three hours later, it's nine o'clock. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last day, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It's available to anybody. And uh, people that had the spirit upon them, we read about King David had the spirit upon him, uh, Saul had the spirit upon him, prophets had the spirit upon them, and it came upon them to do a work, to do something that they weren't uh, able to do, to give them an understanding or wisdom or, or perform a miracle. Uh, and it left them. Remember King Saul uh, departed from God and the spirit left him. And so, But in the New Testament, the spirit means more than that. It means that we are a new creature in God. We're born again. And so now in verse 37, when they heard this and the explanations, as Peter went through quite a bit of detail, uh, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? All right, this is getting somewhere now. Jesus has spoken about it. This experience happened. The disciples are thrilled about it. You know, Jesus' mother was there. All those mentioned in Acts chapter 1 were there. About 120 all spoke in tongues at once. And, um, and Peter's explaining the strange phenomenon, the strange experience, and they say, well, what do we do? What do we do to get it? What, what does God want us to do? Something's happening here. And he said, and Peter said in verse 38, Repent means change your mind. Now, they were in Jerusalem because of the Jewish feast day. They were there being very zealous for God, uh, you know, a, a Jew. But that isn't the answer. And uh, be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, let's say burial and water, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise to you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words that he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received his word were baptised, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 people received the Holy Spirit the same way. Uh, many had been baptised before uh, you know, in Jerusalem by John the Baptist, and nothing had happened. And these people obeyed uh, what Peter had said, and they were able to receive this promise of the Holy Spirit. The church begun, 3,000 people. All right, and that's a, that's a pattern for us today. We're far off in time, far off in distance, but the same promise because God is here. God will answer, confirm his word with signs following. And so as we're talking about um, something wonderful, there it is, born again, Holy Spirit in you. And uh, this wonderful language to pray to God, this evidence, receiving the Holy Spirit. And some people think, oh, it can't be that simple, right? It can't be that simple. Just do two things, you know, repent, saying, okay, I'm not going to argue with God and get baptised, buried under water, a split second, a few seconds. Uh, you don't have to hold your breath for long, a few seconds, and we help you sit up. That can't be that easy. Well, it's a gift, isn't it? Right? We, we show God we, we want it. We show God we, we uh, believe him. We, we, we act out of uh, obedience and we get the promise. And uh, that's how simple it is. I don't know why people want to debate this because, you know, when you receive it, it you, you know, you don't regret it. It's wonderful. And so we'll move on uh, to 1 Corinthians 1 because I want to explain the change in the couple of minutes we've got. Um, so I want to finish a little bit early. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, I'll just read the scriptures. I think I won't expound them. So um, three scriptures before we finish. 1 Corinthians 2, it says here in verse 11, 
For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? And it's right. Animals know how to behave like animals. Um, you know, birds know how to fly. We don't. But we know how to be human and we know how to, to look after ourselves and, you know, run and do all the things that humans do. And, uh, you know, we communicate with other humans. It save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God, of God knows no man but the spirit of God. You can't understand it. It's confusing. As he says here, for we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom speaks, teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, scripture with scripture. But the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And when I was talking about the confidence we have of living forever, that there is eternal life there, it all happens when you receive the Holy Spirit. You receive that understanding. You receive that, that knowledge and that evidence um, that what God has said, you know, and that's what comparing spiritual with spiritual uh, adds up to make sense. It's, uh, it's real. And the evidence is you're living that life. You're living what Jesus said. It doesn't just happen one day. That's the beginning of a new life that grows. That's a wonderful scripture there. We'll have a look at another in Romans. As I say, I'm not going to expand too much, but Romans. Maybe for folks that like to watch YouTube, and these talks are uh, recorded, maybe look at it in detail later. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, it says here again, the problem before we receive the Spirit, it doesn't make sense, we can't understand it, you know, we don't see it, we need to change. But it says in verse 8, they that are in the flesh, just human beings, cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It's that important. People think, oh, I've got something else. I've got love. I've got the Holy Spirit, or, or um, I don't need it. But yes, you do. And if Christ or the Spirit of Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. It, it, it is what is perfect in you. It is from God. Uh, but if the Spirit of him that uh, raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwells in you. That's how you're going to live forever, but also that's how your life's going to change. You're going to be changed from the inside. As I say, you know, my habits, you're smoking and drinking and drugs and things like that, well, you grow out of it. You just suddenly don't want to do it anymore. Um, you know, that change happens from within and not somebody telling you what to do. And so at the resurrection of the dead, it all makes sense. Being right with God, understanding the things of God happens with the Holy Spirit uh, when you receive. And so it's definitely something to look forward to. In verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Sometimes I thought that if I join a church, suddenly, you know, my freedom's over. I've got to do what I'm told. I've got to do what people tell me. You know, it's going to be boring. But uh, that's not the case at all. You've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That, uh, God becomes our dad. We have that, that confidence that our prayers are going to be answered. Last scripture, 1 John 3, um, just about ready for communion, if you guys want to get ready. 1 John 3, wonderful epistles to people who have the Holy Spirit. That's what these uh, our last books are. Uh, John the Apostle's writing here to the church. In 1 John 3, he says, uh, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. We just read that. If you've got the Spirit, you're a son of God or a daughter of God. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. There is uh, something in a mystery, something happening in this life going by and people can't see it. You know, it's a parallel universe, if you like. God's doing things his way. The world is doing things their way. And, um, and as we uh, receive the Holy Spirit, we suddenly see what God's doing. 
Beloved, now are we the sons of God and does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, when Jesus returns, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And down a little further in verse 9, whosoever is born of God, born again of the Spirit, does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. For this is a message we have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. And so when you receive the Holy Spirit, the evidence of appreciating that, of valuing that, is how you treat others that have got the Holy Spirit. Obviously, you know, you're um, celebrating what God's doing in their life as well as he's doing in your life. And, uh, you know, they're going to have problems, they're going to have stumble, whatever, but you don't want them to fail. You want to lift them up. You want to encourage them. You want to be there for them. And that just comes with the Spirit. And all people said, all right, so there's uh, some things perhaps you've never heard of before, an invitation to find out for yourself. We have uh, warm water in the tank today. You can be baptised and, and 